Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 8 of Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. With all the focus on Arcady Zimmerman, people also have been forgetting Tatiana here, who has been doing some amazing work with the X-Plane program. Uh, her skills have pushed experimental aircraft using air-breathing engines past the sound barrier for a regular uh, science uh, reputation and funds from these uh, X-plane contracts essentially. So we're having to maintain the speed of between 587 and 797 for three minutes and this well actually takes a long time to get up to speed. This thing was actually launched on top of a rocket just to get it off the pad but after that separated this uh, air breathing engine with an afterburner kicked in and uh, yeah you can see that it does actually hit the relevant speed and well there there's a bit of chance to do some science here and there but she's more interested in just keeping the thing level. Notice that I also had to do a lot of tweaking on those control surfaces to keep them working. Uh, that's the next thing I'm sure we'll get in Ferrum Aerospace, is different control surface deflections for different speed ranges. Anyway, the contract complete. She returns the aircraft to the ground in the way that all aircraft in this program have been returning to the ground, by parachute. But, back on the space side of things, there is this successful re-entry contract, which seems like a good opportunity to do, uh, it develops some new technology, so uh, what we need to do is take a craft into orbit, a uh, new one obviously, and return it and recover it. Uh, while we're at it, we can probably do one of these suborbital space flights. We just need to get up to 300 kilometers. So the idea is we're going to build a manned mini aircraft, a new type of aircraft that has never flown before. And this is it, the X-Infinity. Yes, this is a, the next evolution in space plane design. We've Got, we've stepped away from the X-1 with its wings and control surfaces and really pared things down just to the cockpit and not very much else. In fact, uh, it's really skimping on many things. For example, it has only about two hours worth of oxygen in it. So we have one chance to get this right. It is by far the largest space vehicle ever created. Massing more than 40 tons means that we have to have upgraded, uh, in this case, the runway. We are still launching from Cape Canaveral. However, we have now got an updated rocket site at a, in near the equator in South America. Anyway, we have gone through our first stage and the RD-103s are just about to run out of ethanol and liquid oxygen. So we're gonna ditch those. And they have nice little uh, aerodynamic deflection systems to pull them away from the core. The core itself is powered by four Vanguard engines, all running off of kerosene and liquid oxygen. These are of course much lower thrust than the RD-103s, but a bit higher efficiency, so we prefer those over the RD-103s for a large part of the trip to orbit. Note that we have extra control fins all the way down this rocket because the fins near the front do tend to push the center of a aerodynamic drag a long way forwards. I'm also impressed that Arcady, despite flying a vehicle that no one has ever seen before, an experience that is unparalleled in Kerbal experience, is still finding time to perform science. Okay, so the central stage is about to burn out. And we have a second stage here, which is also powered by a Vanguard. We need the solid boosters here to make sure the fuel settles correctly and we don't end up with vapor in the fuel lines. But now we continue to orbit. The efficiency of this stage isn't much lower than the, the final stage, but uh, it has a lot more thrust, which really helps given the mass of this thing. I mean, sure, we could have waited for bigger and more powerful engines, or we could just go with this crazy contraption as it is. That's actually one of the things I wanted to do with this realistic scale playthrough, was say, uh, just to concentrate on space planes initially, essentially evolve the space planes into rockets, and not abandon it and completely switch over to capsules right away. Anyway, it's time for the final stage. This is, of course, an AJ-10 vacuum engine. And this will hopefully carry us up to, finally, up to orbital velocity here. 
Arcadia has of course switched over to internal oxygen. I'm kind of imagining that this is really just like the X1 cockpit, so it does it isn't pressurized. He's just wearing a spacesuit inside there to to uh, perform this mission. Presumably they've made a few other upgrades to make sure that it can survive the heat of re-entry. Perhaps they've silvered that glass a bit and uh, added some heat shielding. I don't know. This uh, final stage takes a really long time to burn, but uh, you can see that I'm just dropping the nose down to try to keep the time to apoaps you know, working at reasonable numbers. The idea, of course, is that you want the time to apoaps to hit zero just as you hit orbit, so that you're perfectly in orbit. We don't need, as we go higher and faster, the amount of deflection we need gets lower and lower. Uh, to be honest, I think my launch trajectories are still too steep, and I'm missing about a lot of, uh, you know, useful delta V earlier in the launch. I, and that's just because I'm not used to these real scale launches. And uh, of course, the penalty for going too steep is frequently that I have to you know, continue to have to pull up more and end up exceeding my angle of attack limitations and you know, losing the vehicle. Now, you'll also notice that Science Alert is telling me that we have an EVA ex experiment available. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a hatch, so it'll tell me that we have the EVA experiment, but I can't actually do it because he can't get outside. However, in a way that is authentic because, let's face it, the pilots, we didn't do EVA until Voskhod or uh, Gemini. Neither of the original spacecraft were really designed for EVAs early on. Although I guess the Vostok was included in an ejector seat. But there we have it! Arcady is in orbit! He is the first person to orbit the Earth. Uh, he is doing it in his tiny X-Infinity flyer. We have a little reaction control system on board, which uh, got a throttle down. But look! We're over the Atlantic here. We're going to pass over Africa, the Indian Ocean, Australia, Indonesia, Pacific, and then we'll be back over home territory. And we hopefully will be re-entering by that point, because otherwise he will be suffocating if he doesn't. Okay, so let's find my spacecraft there. There it is there. 200 meters away. I guess I guess the detachment charges really pushed me quite hard. Okay, now enable the reaction control system. Disable. Okay, there we go. Ah, oh, wait. Disable this SES. No, there. That's it. There's the sun there. Look at the beautiful view he is seeing. Although he's actually seen this several times. But he hasn't seen the Atlantic from this high up. He's always been in sight of... Uh, North America or Kazakhstan or whatever. This is the first time he's been this far away from a rocket launch site. Okay, so now we have about 45 minutes until we're around the other side of the planet. At this point, time to do whatever science we can. Grabbing science from shorelines, grab, grabbing science from uh, tropics, water, deserts. It's all good as long as we transmit it when we're within range of a target. Oh yeah, Madagascar. I forgot to comment we're flying over Madagascar. There's Australia and that is our cue to start our de-orbit burn. Mostly using the onboard reaction control system here. You don't need a huge amount of delta V to de-orbit, just enough to lower your periaps. And we've got a speed record. All the speed records until, well, escape velocity or something, I guess. X-Infinity has got everything. I don't know if there's uh, any reward for getting a Kerbal into orbit, but his reward is to see the sunrise in a way that no other Kerbal has before. Well, assuming he can, you know, look over his, his, uh, Oh, wait a second, he's upside down, so if he's upside down, that would be his right shoulder. Yeah, if he could look over his right shoulder, he'll see the sun coming up. I, unfortunately, I don't think the windows are going to let him really see this. Having said that, the viewport is obviously vastly better than the Mercury capsule, or the Gemini capsule, or the actually any space capsule. This is a, an aircraft. It's designed for visibility. We've got all this extra heavy glass and things like that. I mean, presumably, once we invent rocket, or sorry, once we invent space capsules, they will be a little lighter, right? <laughs> Less visibility, more uh, lightness, better technology, more robustness, more ability to stay in orbit. I mean, this is the stock amount of oxygen that's included with 
uh, with this cockpit. And I, you know, after flying this, I began to wonder if there was a way to add more oxygen using the procedural fuel tanks. I didn't bother to think, but I'll have to try that. Anyway, our periaps height is now down below about 70, and it's time for us to orient ourselves for re-entry. Oh, wait, we are oriented for re-entry because the re-entry is going to happen on the other side of the planet. This is us flying over the Pacific. Look at this. This is the first time someone has seen sunrise and sunset within such a short period of time. Arcady will no doubt be an inspiration to us all when he returns, assuming he survives. More importantly, I'm sure he'll have this... Oh, he'll have something to tell the scientists. Another crew report about stuff and basic telemetry. Send those... We are indeed in range. The trick is to make sure you don't transmit it when you're not within range, because then you just lose the data. Okay, so we are deploying the flaps for descent. What this... Oh, wait... Oh. Oh man. Okay, so I think I made some minor modifications to this. I thought it was I thought it was a bit top heavy. Apparently, I've added an extra set of flaps when messing around with my bottom flaps. Originally, those two flaps were in two different groups. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, the idea of these flaps at the top are these, I don't know what you call them. They're spoilers, I guess. They fold out and they cause the nose to sit high so that it will keep the wings high enough so that we'll stop our descent or slow our descent and help us you know safely re-enter without burning up if you just let the thing go nose first you will probably nose dive into the atmosphere and just break up right now i'm actually using rcs to hold orientation since we're really high up and none of the other control surfaces will be particularly effective but in a moment we turn it off the nose dips down but uh, after a bit of oscillation, it comes back up. So we, we do have a stable attitude here, and we just try to arrest the oscillation with the RCS fuel and pick the stable orientation, let's say, using the least amount of fuel here. So yeah, this is all just really tiny flaps attached to this thing to make sure that it, it adjusts and flies correctly here. We have a single parachute for landing. Uh, we, we went through a lot of iterations on this. Or I say we. I went through a lot of iterations on this in the simulations. And I then went and changed it after I went for the final deployment. So that's why we have these double set of flaps on the top. They do actually look pretty cool, though. They're, they're a combination of aero brakes and, I don't know, brakes to adjust the center of mass, really. More science for but a second, but we missed our opportunity. Now we're down to about 80 kilometers. You can see the heat is really starting to build up in this. And now the firestorm really begins here. Watch that vertical speed. The vertical speed isn't decreasing too quickly. We're, we're pretty good here. Currently, we're experiencing over 1G of deceleration. We're going to experience higher and higher forces as we uh, get lower and lower. So there are 2Gs. And hopefully some of that is pushing us up to slower descent just a little. Oh, three Gs, three G, and yes, our vertical speed is slowing. You see that? Up, oh, we're hitting four Gs. There's a lot of force and a lot of flames, but our KD knows how to handle this. He experienced worse on launch at this point. He experienced up to five Gs during the launch, so re-entry is actually a whole lot easier on him than the launch was. But that's us. Look, it's now through the atmosphere safely. Arcady has successfully re-entered. He just needs to land. And so uh, I just try to test out the handling to see how it is. We've obviously, it, it performs re-entry spectacularly well. But uh, when it's hypersonic, uh, it does actually, I can actually lift the nose up here and gain altitude if I like. I'm just trying to turn back towards, I guess that's the Caribbean over there. Hard to tell, we're, you know, at 100,000 feet at this altitude, so you don't really know what you're seeing. Arcadia is no doubt thinking something poetic, like, up from up here, we cannot see any borders. He's also thinking from up here, I can't see the recovery team. So he's just going to ditch it in the ocean and, well, hang out until they find him. So as soon as we go subsonic, the thing just noses down and does not like to work. So it's time to deploy the spoiler once again. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't, it, although the nose is sitting high, it doesn't really, you know, slow our descent by that much. 
we're still going down in a 60 degree dive technically, but we're doing it at a much more sedate pace. Although with stability control it does look like we're wobbling all over the place. I think some iteration is needed on the X-Infinity. I think really we do need to invent that space capsule concept that Werner's talking about. I mean, you know, he's always talking about mass and he's complaining about these pilots who like to be able to see things. I mean, I think it's telling that Werner will frequently refer to the pilots as the biological payload. And he's been known to hide all the snacks in the rec room to make sure that the pilots don't put on any weight, or rather, extraneous mass, as he likes to say. Anyway, look, we're down below the altitude, uh, down below deployment altitude, and this thing sits nicely. I guess uh, the pilot does feel a little constrained getting pushed forward, but, 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 this is an, uh, a great moment for all Kerbal kind. A flight that lasted just under two hours and brought him all the way around the world. Arcady is indeed a hero to all Kerbals. And uh, more important, he is the Kerbal that helped us complete that all-important recovery from orbit contract, which will give us cash. Let's just check the contract. Okay. Yes, we got a suborbital space flight. Up to that. Great. And we don't have any other contracts. Because, of course, I have to recover it. I have to recover the vessel, don't I? Recover the vessel and uh, head on over to their office to pick up the cash, the prestige, the science, the women, or whatever. I don't know. Or, you know, Arcady, that's what he asked for. Um, so, yes, uh, hundred and s loads of science, loads of money. Arcady has advanced to level one because he is a pro. And, okay, so this didn't... What do you mean the contract requires an unmanned spacecraft? That's, that, that's some sort of fine print lawyerism. Well, um, I guess I know what I'm going to be doing in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.